Hello and welcome to The Paytech Show. Now on today's episode, we're going to be finding out about how ISO 20022 is revolutionizing payments, especially now that they travel at real-time speeds. Joining us, we have guests from BNY Mellon and Volante Technologies, two organizations that are really grappling with the heart of this infrastructural change and also payment culture change too. Dialing in virtually, we had Rachel Hunt from Volante Technologies talk to our director, Ali Passon, about how they're helping institutions of all shapes and sizes really grapple with this huge change. Ali Patterson also headed over to New York to speak with Carl Bicky at BMY Mellon to find out how they were moving from not just checks, but really embracing this digital change. Now, I also caught up with Isabel Schmidt over at Cybos. We were lucky to get her for a bit of time to find out how they were really embracing this new change. And so, well, without further ado, let's get on with the episode. How does BMY Mellon spearhead staying at the forefront of payments? So I think it's a combination of things that you know you one really has to do to to achieve this. One is, as, as you said, staying on top of customer demands and really understanding what's driving the the underlying needs. Nobody gets up in the morning and buys a payment, right? <laughs> so the, a payment is kind of a, a knock-on effect of something else and understanding how therefore your, that payment experience fits into what's happening to your client, what are they trying to do and it doesn't matter whether, the, again, whether it's a retail client or whether it's a business client, just understanding those business processes is absolutely fundamental, right? So that's one. The second piece I think is understanding everything that's happening in the marketplace. It's a very dynamic uh, time in this industry. Um, there is evolution of existing payment systems. Those still are, they're there. They continue to exist. We continue to operate them. They fill and fulfill a certain need. They continue to evolve. And then there's new payment systems. As we know, you know, real-time payments is developing at really fast speed globally. So staying on top of that and understanding those trends. And then understanding how do you how do you stitch an ecosystem that's getting more and more complicated how do you stitch that together for customers to make it simple and that's really what we're trying to do so in terms of sticky issues um, I think there are a few um, one is and then um, take us back to the beginning is maybe lack of digitization right so the cross-border payment ecosystem was established 40 years ago at a time where you know business was being done very differently, right? And yet we haven't transformed the rails and the infrastructure. So I think another major pain point is a lovely word of regulation and inconsistency in in what is required across the globe, um, which always uh, is 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 creating friction. Um, and and again, the third is all of these new payment systems and how do you make sense of it? How do you how do you connect? So all of these pieces create friction, they create hurdles to doing, you know, to delivering a really fast and seamless payment experience. I've been a big proponent of instant payments globally. It's just such an interesting phase of innovation and it actually brings in a complete business change um, in the way that the banks interact with their customers. It's not just the introdu introduction of a new method of payments. It has some fundamental impact in the way that you run your business um, and how you think you're going to service your customers. It's always a journey towards instant payments because um, there's so many parts of the organization that are going to be touched on. It's the peoples, the processes, uh, the systems that you have put in place. But what's really ex exciting in the US is if we've got a little bit of a hockey stick moment. Um, a couple of reasons for that. Uh, I think the pandemic clearly uh, showed that we had to be digital it was important to have real-time information and real-time payments um, to, to, to navigate, you know, the ups and downs of, of everything we've gone through with the pandemic, but also making sure that organizations could continue to operate. And instant payments from that perspective is brilliant because you have visibility of, uh, you know, 
being able to manage your liquidity better, um, making sure that the payments get there at the right time, eliminating paper-based processes. Clearly, we realize that checks in the, in, the, in the middle of a crisis is probably not the best way to go. It's still extremely prevalent across the US, whether you're talking business to business payments, consumers paying each other, consumers paying their bills. There's still over 10 billion checks written annually across the US for all of those use cases. Just for consumer bill pay alone, so think about a consumer paying their phone bill or their utility bill, there's 2.3 billion checks paid each year for just consumers paying businesses. When you think about everything that's included in that, think about a paper bill going in an envelope, getting in a truck, going to an individual, someone sitting there manually opening it, writing a check, ripping off a slip, putting it back in an envelope, putting it back in a truck to send it back, 2.3 billion times every year. BNY Mellon alone processes 300 million checks a year, uh, for our clients, for the banks and the corporate. So still very prevalent, uh, prevalent, still still huge, and that's really a lot of our focus, is what digital innovations can we bring, how can we educate our clients, and how can we really accelerate that move off of paper, because it's getting more costly, it's getting more onerous. So you've got the, the double whammy of both the, the paper kind of processing of a check, but also the electri ele electric data center processing of the check as well. A absolutely, and you know, just like BNY Mellon, a lot of other companies are coming out with, with ESG targets and goals, um, things they want to commit to the market um, as, as part of their corporate strategy. Our clients are, are the same, right? So if we can actually give them data to manage and track that and tie that back to their payment strategy, and here's the things that they can actually do to track and manage that over time, it helps them live up to those goals publicly and internally and put some action plans and business plans around it that also have those traditional inherent business benefits like cost and risk reduction, et cetera. The things that are happening at the moment that everybody's talking about and that are at the forefront of our minds that we tr need to try to solve is creating rails, creating you know, rails that allow payments to travel seamlessly. And you know, ISO 2022 is uh, you know, a big element of that strategy of creating these seamless rails. SWIFT is doing a lot of work in trying to connect the dots between the banks and creating capabilities to allow faster payments, more transparent payments, seamless and predictable. So that's a, that's a key element um, as well that we're seeing. Um, and, then, and then finally, I think um, the, the, the real-time payment systems you know, and, and connectivities between those, such as you know, IXB, uh, are important trends. All of this to eliminate friction and make the experience faster. So a lot of preparations across the industry globally. Um, I think the, the biggest lesson learned problem from what we've seen over the last two to three years, which is when banks really started going into this, is it's complicated. It really is difficult. Um, it's easy to underestimate the complexity, the amount of learning organizations have to do, and the depth of change that we have to go through, not just from the core payment systems, but everything else that goes around. And then, you know, there is the question of, if we have to do all this work, how can we get to a better data environment uh, and, and treating data more, more intelligently than we have in the past. And again, that requires actually quite a bit of work. One is the technical rails to carry the data, but you have to have the data first, right? And which on one hand means effort on the banks handling their own data, the data that they have on clients, but it also means the touch points with customers who are initiating payments or receiving payments and reconciling those those have to be upgraded as well, clients have to be educated. So I think in terms of really rich structured data, we're probably going to, uh, we're going to see this a little further down the road. Um, you know, once the, the standard is established, the industry knows how to use it, and then we can really leverage the power of that data. And that's going to be really exciting. One of the biggest challenges for some of the mid-tier um, organizations is a couple of things. One is, the resources available in the market. We're in an incredibly tight environment in terms of skill sets and people. Um, but there's also a, a fundamental shift in terms of what is my core offering? Am I really a tech provider? Can I really spend you know, this investment um, building my own teams, building um, the scalability, the resilience, all of these things that you have to have with real-time payments in-house, or do I need to look at partnering with, with a vendor? And there's so much innovation going on at the moment that you've got to balance 
what is your core sort of skills within the organizations as well as being able to adapt to all this change and innovation and of course when you talk about software as a service or payment as a service people always mention cost first you know there's some economies of scales the vendor invests in that environment it's secure it's tested it, it complies uh, to the regulation and so people always think about the cost first as a as a as a reason to go towards software as a service but increasingly we see payments as a service or software as a service as a way of dealing and managing change and innovation um, so if you want to keep up with all the changes going on in payments in the US or globally, then you have to think about real time. You have to think about the journey towards ISO 2002. So that is another big change um, that is going to happen um, in the US by 2025. And, and that's a lot of things and streams of work that you have to look at it. And generally, when you try and do it internally, if you're sort of an organization of a certain size, then you're going to go to the minimum viable offering um, and think about it as, you know, either compliance or just getting reachable, but you're not really gaining the benefits of the sort of transformation that these things will allow you to do. So software as a service has been a way of thinking, right, I'm going to find the right partners. I'm going to find somebody who has an offering that is already built for scale, for resilience, for availability, um, and is also going to be a partner to me to bring me the next set of innovation requirements that are going to happen because we're no longer in a world where the new methods of payments happen once every 20 years. <laughs> there's, you know, new rails, that's one thing, but then there's the value added services that, that are coming up on like a request for pay or request to pay, depending where you are in the world. Um, and there's everything that's attached to it with APIs, how you're going to sort of, you know, embed that offering within um, the broader supply chain or the broader payments uh, chain, value chain. So. I think, you know, it's not just having a solution that is built for scale and resilience and availability. It's also having a solution that's going to take you um, through that change and that transformation. Um, and again, you know, not us talking about this, the, the multiple analysts are now saying, well, as a service is really where the majority like 80 percent of organizations are thinking about their strategy and and getting and consuming payment software so so that's pretty critical i think the amount of data in, in that is required to make a payment is, is in terms of sheer size of data not the largest amount i can still as a con, as a consumer i can log in and download a couple of gigabyte movie from yeah. california yeah. and i can watch and process that and that's, that's gigabytes of information. And yet, it still takes days for, at best, at, at most, a couple of megabytes of information of payment data to be processed. What, why is that? Why is it still, for what is a, a quite a small amount of data, why does it still take days to actually kind of adhere and process to that? What's the, where, where's the, uh, the bottleneck? That, that's, that's a good question. So a lot of the legacy payment systems um, were built off of these batch cycles. They were built on Monday through Friday, business hour cycles and settlement windows. Um, and there were a lot of legacy, even manual processes to review payments and sign off on payments and do all the, the things that a bank would need to do from a risk or a compliance perspective. What we're seeing now though, and it's again, it's kind of coming up in pockets. So RTP in the US, UK Faster Payments, MPP in Australia, on and on, at least within certain domestic regions, paying within those corridors, the world is now open, at least within that region, 24-7, 365 instant. And from an open banking model, um, you know, natively the way we build everything today is we API first, right? So we microservice everything in an API because we want our billers, our banks, our broker dealer clients to plug these into their app, to their website. So when you log on and you say, hey, I want to pay my bill, you you hit click, you don't want to see that little disclaimer that says, you know, hey, your payment will be made in three to five business days and you're sitting there saying like, what is going on? You want to see, boom, check mark, done, payments confirmed, that's it. And making sure that the behind the scenes payment processing matches that front end experience. So I think open banking APIs and the new instant payment schemes are doing that 
again, within certain borders. What we need to do is make sure that's the global real-time payment story. So, so I mentioned Swift is doing um, that for using SwiftGo and, and, and a lot of their tracking. Another really exciting initiative that's going on is, is IXB, um, or real-time cross-border payments. So this is something that we're participating in. It's a pilot group of 24 banks. We're working with Swift, working with the Clearinghouse, working with EBA Clearing. And the goal is to connect RTP in the US with RT1 in the EU. And we want to basically connect 25 EU countries in the US to be able to send 24-7 instant payments end-to-end, -end, including FX, including conversion, including finality, and use that as a model to pivot to the rest of the world. Um, so this is a, a minimum pilot. It's going to go live at the end of 2022, um, fuller scale into 2023, and then we really want to expand that to, to some of the other ready regions. That's all we've got time for on today's episode. I just want to say a massive thank you to our guests, Carl, Isabel, and Rachel. It's been absolutely fascinating hearing how the industry is going to change, and I really think these two institutions really are at the heart of that. Also, big thank you to you, our viewers. You can catch the rest of the series and much more over at www.ffnews.com. Of course, YouTube, but especially LinkedIn, where you'll see me in the crew. Guys, thank you very much. Have a lovely day.